In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. Amen. Today is the first Saturday of August, 2023. Today we want to fulfill the request of the Virgin Mary to make reparation to her Immaculate Heart. If every Catholic did this, modernism would be overthrown, we would have a good Pope, we would have a Pope that would finally obey Our Lady, consecrate Russia, there would be the triumph of the Immaculate Heart of Mary, and the spreading of the kingship of Christ every in every nation, at every political level, at least most. But that was the complaint of Sister Lucia, not enough are listening to Our Lady, they ignore her, the good go on their merry way, and don't take seriously what Our Lady asked. The popes are si silent, they don't consecrate the way Our Lady asked, the bishops are not pushing it, <clears throat> and modernism has therefore crept in, as Our Lady foretold, and communism and socialism are spreading everywhere. The grip, the cold grip of communism, spreading everywhere. So let us fulfill these five first requests. One, pray the rosary today. Two, receive communion. For those following in live stream, they would receive the spiritual communion. And by desire, they could receive more grace than all of us come in and receiving an actual Holy Communion. If their desire is, is noble and pure before God. So, Holy Communion, third communion, confession on that day or eight days before or after. Fourth, 15 minutes meditation on the mystery of Christ's life. So we will do that. This will count for your 15 minute meditation. What I'm gonna, what we'll cover with St. Alphonsus very soon. And then lastly, the explicit intention to make reparation to her Immaculate Heart, to pull out a thorn from her bleeding heart. Let's look at the fifth sorrow of the Virgin Mary. We've been covering the, the seven sorrows. We're up to number five, the death of our Lord Jesus Christ. This is from St. Alphonsus, and you can't improve on this. He, he does... A masterpiece of here it is we have now to witness a new kind of martyrdom a mother condemned to see an innocent son and one whom she loves with the whole affection of her soul cruelly tormented and put to death before her own eyes there stood by the cross of Jesus his mother says st. John st. John believed that in these words he had said enough of Mary's martyrdom. Consider her at the foot of the cross, in the presence, standing before her dying son, and then see if there be a sorrow like unto her sorrow. Let us remain for a while this day on Calvary, and consider the fifth sword, which, which in the death of Jesus transfixed the heart of Mary. As soon as our agonized Redeemer had reached the Mount of Calvary, the executioner stripped him of his clothes and piercing his hands and feet, not with sharp, but with blunt nails, says St. Bernard, to torment him more, and they nailed him to the cross. Having crucified him, they planted the cross and thus left him to die. The executioners left him, but not Mary. She then drew nearer to the cross to be present at his death. Our Lady told St. Bridget, I did not leave him, but stood closer to the cross. But what did it all avail thee, O Lady, says St. Bonaventure, to go to Calvary and see this son expire? Shame should have prevented you, for his disgrace was yours, since you were his mother. Uh, open brackets. Remember, our Lord was the scorn. He was the humiliation of the whole city of Jerusalem and all the thousands and thousands of people there. If you were just traveling there and you didn't know, have any idea what was going on, you would just know that there was some wicked criminal being crucified between two thieves, and he must have been very a great criminal because 
everyone's gathered around his cross, throwing rocks, uh, blaspheming, cursing, yelling at him. So if you were just a bystander and didn't know at all what was going on in Calvary, on Mount Calvary, you would assume this is a very big criminal and he deserves to die. He must have done something very big. And for his mother to stand there, she takes all the insults as well. So she takes all the brunt of the blasphemies with her divine son. So this is the nobility of Our Lady. She was glad to, to suffer this with him. And then St. Bonaventure says, uh, continues, the, the disgrace should have prevented you, Mother, from going at the foot of the cross. At least horror of witnessing such a crime as the crucifixion of a god by his own creatures should have prevented thee from going there. But St. Bonaventure adds, Oh, thy heart did not then think of its own sorrows, but of the sufferings and death of thy dear son. And therefore you would yourself be present at least to compassionate him. A true mother, says Abbot William, most loving mother, whom not even the fear of death could separate from thy beloved son. So we all know from all, it's obvious that Our Lady would gladly have died with our Lord, crucified as well, if she could have, in place of him. Such was her love. But, O oh God, what a cruel sight was it there to behold this son in agony on the cross, and at its foot this mother in agony, suffering all the torments endured by her son. Listen to the words in which the Virgin Mary revealed to St. Bridget the sorrowful state in which she saw her dying Jesus on the cross. These are the words of Our Lady. My dear Jesus was breathless. Breathless. So he's panting for air on the cross. He can't hardly breathe. And it's a, it's a struggle to, to just pull in some air and whistle the air out, pulling himself up and then uh, releasing the air and sagging back down on the cross. And a constant torture. So that alone, just to hear someone suffocating, would be extremely painful. We had in, in Syracuse one of the one of the jogathons, one of the one of the uh, boys had a bad case of asthma. And during the jogathon, he, he had to pull out. So, of course, you know, people gather around to see if he's okay, if he needs water, whatever. Uh, but he was panting for air. He was, so, he was really struggling to breathe. So it's pretty painful to witness. But this, that was just a few minutes. But here, for three constant hours. So Our Lady goes on to say, My dear Jesus was breathless, exhausted, and his last and in his last agony on the cross. His eyes were sunk, half-closed and lifeless, his lips hanging and his mouth open, his cheeks hollow and drawn in, his face elongated, his nose sharp, his countenance sad. His head had fallen on his chest, his hair was black with blood, his stomach collapsed, his arms and legs stiff, and his whole body covered with wounds and blood. St. Bernard's, no, St. Vincent Ferrer says it's 72 wounds on the head alone, deep wounds. And then our Lord revealed to St. Bridget there was well over 4,500 wounds all over Christ's body. And the shroud shows 630 deep wounds. So the, the shroud would pick up the deeper wounds that would be impressed on the image. So the smaller wounds, the cuts, the bruises, the, the infections setting in, all this was, was all part of those wounds, 4,500 wounds. All these sufferings of Jesus were also those of Mary. 
Every torture inflicted on the body of Jesus, says St. Jerome, was a wound in the heart of the mother. Whoever then was present on Mount Calvary, says St. John Chrysostom, might see two altars on which two great sacrifices were consummated, the one in the body of Jesus, the other in the heart of Mary. Nay, better still, may we say with St. Bonaventure, there was but one altar, that of the cross of the Son, on which together with his divine Lamb, the victim, the mother, was also sacrificed. Therefore the saint asked this mother, O lady, where are you? Near the cross? Nay, rather, thou art on the cross, crucified, sacrificing thyself with thy Son. St. Augustine assures us of the same thing. The cross and nails of the Son were also those of his mother. With Christ crucified, the mother was also crucified. St. Bernard says, yes, love inflicted on the heart of, Je of Mary, the tortures caused by nails in the body of Jesus. So much so that as St. Bernardine writes, at the same time that the son sacrificed his body, the mother sacrificed her soul. Mothers ordinarily flee away from the presence of their dying children. But when a mother is obliged to witness such a scene, she procures all possible relief for her child. She arranges his bed and pillows that he may be more at ease. She administers refreshments to him. And thus the poor mother soothes her own grief. Ah, most afflicted of all mothers, O Mary, thou hast to witness the agony of thy dying Jesus, but you cannot administer him any relief whatsoever. Mary heard her son exclaim, I thirst, but she could not even give him a drop of water to refresh him in that great thirst. She could only say, as St. Vincent Ferrer remarks, My son, I only have the water of my tears. She saw that on that bed of torture, her son, suspended by the three nails, could find no repose. She would have clasped him in her arms to give him relief, or that at least he might there have expired, but she could not. In vain, says St. Bernard, in vain did she extend her arms. They sank back empty on her breast. She beheld that poor son who in his sea of grief sought consolation as it was foretold by the prophet, but in vain. I have trod in the winepress alone. I looked about and there was none to help. I sought and there was none to give aid. And this is the complaint of our Lord, not just on the cross, but in the tabernacle. Were our souls to visit him? Were our souls to spend an hour with him? To console him? To make reparation? It's the same complaint. I have trod in the winepress alone. I looked around and there was none to help. I sought and there was none to give aid. And this is very true, even in our churches and parishes. That I've been at. Um, aside maybe from St. Mary's, a big credit to St. Mary's faithful, that's a big credit to them, there's a constant holy hour going on at St. Mary's, day and night, for many years now, over 30 years. And that's a blessing for those people. So, uh, but in other parishes, Rarely you see, even traditional Catholics at this stage of the war, rarely you see them come and visit our Lord in the Blessed Sacrament. Rarely. Rarely. And Sunday Mass is just come in, leave. Daily Mass, if they come, come in, leave. And our Lord sits and waits for someone to stay a little longer just to console him, make reparation to him, pull out a thorn, save a soul from hell, and at least console the heart of Jesus. And that's after all the apparitions of Our Lady, of the Sacred Heart, of, the, of our Lord Jesus Christ, and many hundreds of apparitions to saints, victim souls, mystics like Mary of Agreda, 
<clears throat> and yet our Lord, even in the best traditional parishes, is abandoned, forgotten. It's a blight on us. It's a big blight on us traditional Catholics. And Our Lady, if she, she, if she was, I mean, that's what the Mass is. We're really at the foot of the, we're at Calvary. So at least at Mass, adore and console our Lord and ask a great love for Him and console the Immaculate Heart of Mary. But who amongst men would console Him since all were enemies? Even on the cross, He was taunted and blasphemed on all sides. And they that passed by blasphemed him, wagging their heads, says Psalm 21 and St. Matthew chapter 27. Wagging their heads, that is, in, in mockery. There was a Jewish thing, I guess, wagging their heads, shaking it all over the place and spitting. Some said to his face, If thou be the Son of God, come down from the cross. Others said, He saved others. Himself he cannot save. Ha, ha, ha. Again, others said, If he be the king of Israel, let him now come down from the cross and will believe. But our Lord didn't come down. Our Blessed Lady herself said to St. Bridget, I heard some say that my son was a thief. Others said that he was an imposter. Others that no one deserved death more than he did. And every word was a new sword of grief to my heart. So Our Lady's right standing right there, right? And all the Jews are gathered. <clears throat> and they're just mocking and blaspheming right, right next to her. And she doesn't turn around and curse them. She doesn't yell at them. She's not even angry with them. She just suffers everything with our Divine Lord, His Sacred Heart. But that which, the most in, that, that which most increased the sorrows which Mary endured through compassion for His Son was hearing Him complain on the cross that even His Eternal Father had abandoned Him. My God, my God, why hast Thou forsaken me? Words which the Divine Mother told the same St. Bridget could never, during her whole life, depart from her mind. So that the afflicted mother saw her Jesus suffering on every side. She desired to comfort him, but she couldn't. That which grieved her the most was to see that she herself, by her presence and sorrow, also even increased the sufferings of her son. The grief, says St. Bernard, which filled Mary's heart as a torrent flowed into and, and embittered the heart of Jesus. So, yes, it wounded our Lord's heart more to see his mother suffering, because he loved his mother more than any angel or saint. And to see her crushed in sorrow also moved the heart of Jesus. So much so, says the same St. Bernard, that Jesus on the cross suffered more out of compassion for his mother than from his own torments. But he speaks in the name of our Blessed Lady. I stood with my eyes fixed on him and his on me. And he grieved more for me than for himself. And then speaking of Mary beside her dying son, St. Bernard adds, that she lived dying without being able to die. Near the cross of Christ, his mother stood half dead. She spoke not. Dying, she lived, and living, she died. Nor could she die, for death was her very life. St. Bernard. Passino writes that Jesus Christ himself, one day speaking to Blessed Battista Varani, of Camerino, assured her that when on the cross so great was his affliction at seeing his mother at his feet in such bitter anguish, that compassion for her caused him to die without consolation, so much so that the Blessed Baptista, being supernaturally enlightened as to the greatness of this suffering of Jesus, exclaimed, 
O Lord, tell me no more of this I sorrow, for I cannot longer bear it. Simon of Cassia said, All who then saw this mother silent and not uttering a complaint in the midst of such great sorrow were filled with astonishment. But if Mary's lips were silent, her heart was not so, for she incessantly offered the life of her son to the divine justice for our salvation. Therefore we know that by the merits of her sorrows, her dolors, she cooperated in our birth to the life of grace, and hence we are the children of her sorrows. Christ, says Lanspergius, was pleased that she, the cooperatress, the co-redemptrix, and, uh, and whom he had determined to give us for our mother, should be there present, for it was at the foot of the cross that she was to bring us, her children, forth. So a lot of the saints say this. Yeah, Mary gave birth to Jesus Christ in Bethlehem with no pain whatsoever, a bliss of ecstasy. But she gave birth to us in great, great suffering, as a mother gives birth to her children in pain and sorrow. So she gave great suffering to give us birth. On, and her first spiritual child, we could say, was St. Dismas, who converted right on the cross. After our, he saw Our Lady, and after he saw our Lord say, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do, he received that grace. And he converted the good thief, St. Dismas. Just as on the left, he rejected that grace. And then the second immediate fruit of Our Lady was uh, the conversion of Longinus, the good, the, the good centurion, the Roman soldier, who converted also and said in front of everybody, he professed the Catholic faith, truly this was the Son of God. And he witnessed all the, the, the priests and the Jews and scribes and Pharisees mocking and spitting on him and throwing rocks and gravel. But he rose above all that and realized this is more than just a man on the cross. This had to be God. Plus, of course, the tremendous earthquake when he died, the darkness, the eclipse of the sun for three hours. And it was not just a little earthquake. Um, sometimes if you're visiting California, you'll feel a little tremors. They have earthquakes of several times a day out there. You'll just feel little tremors. Uh, but this was a huge earthquake, as all the f saints tell us, and historians as well, that actually shook the core of the earth when Christ died. If any consolation entered that sea of bitterness, the heart of Mary, the only one was this, that she knew that by her sorrows she was leading us to eternal salvation, as Jesus himself revealed to St. Bridget. Here's what he said. My mother Mary, on account of her compassion and, and love, was made the mother of all in heaven and on earth. Extremely beautiful. She becomes, suffering with her divine son, the co-redemptrix, she becomes mother of all the angels, of all the billions and billions and billions of angels, and of all the, human, all the men of the human race. And indeed, these were the last words with which Jesus bid her farewell before his death. This was his last recommendation, leaving us to her, for, for her children, in the person of St. John, when he said, Woman, behold thy son. That son was not himself, but St. John. From that time, Mary began to perform this good office of a mother for us. St. Peter Damien attests <coughs> that by the prayers of Mary, who stood between the cross of the good thief and that of her son, the thief was converted and saved, and thereby she repaid a former service. For as other authors relate, this thief had been kind to Jesus and Mary on their journey to Egypt many years ago. In this same office, the Blessed Virgin 
has ever continued and still continues to perform. So the slightest thing you do for Our Lady is really pleasing to God. And there's many accounts of, you know, many conversions of someone who didn't live a very pious life, but he would make sure there were some flowers at Our Lady's altar. And because of that, he received the grace of the holy deaths. Things like this. Or the guy, the famous story of the guy who, the college kid, who prayed three Hail Marys every day before he went to bed. A practice that was deeply established in the home from the, his father and mother. And he was out partying and getting drunk and fornication and all that. Uh, like wild, some wild college kids. And his friend, they left the, the house of ill repute drunk. His friend was immediately surrounded by devils and they killed him right then and there. And then he was in, he, he didn't know this, he made his way to his house, his apartment, flopped on the bed and said, oh shoot, I forgot the three Hail Marys. Well, he sagged off the bed and knelt down, kneeling on the bed, praying poorly the three Hail Marys, <laughs> and, uh, and then went to sleep on his knees. And then he was woken up by a huge loud noise, a slam of the door, heavy footprints, and a smell of burning sulfur and burning flesh. He turned around, and that was his friend, and he said, what happened to you? And his friend said, my body is still in the street. I'm only here to tell you, the only reason the devils didn't kill you was because you said those three blankety blank in prayers to that blankety blank in woman and then he opened his coat his his whatever was he was wrapped with he opened it it was all flames and serpents and he says i'm damned and that so shook that boy this college boy it so shook him up he ran out and found the body of his friend on the street and then a day after he fell, he went straight to the monastery of the Franciscans and asked to go to confession and even asked to enter as a monk. And he gave his life to God. And it, he, it, it, it ends with a beautiful heroic story. He, he went as a missionary to Japan and he was martyred as one of the many martyrs in the 1600s in Nagasaki that were crucified. Uh, one of the martyrs of Nagasaki. So the three Hail Marys saved him. And when we get to heaven, we're probably going to hear a ton of these kind of stories. Yeah, I didn't live too pious a life, but I said a Hail Mary, or St. Louis de Montfort mentions that nobleman in Spain who didn't pray the rosary himself every day. He was kind of careless with it, but he always wore the rosary around his belt. So people seeing him in public, a nobleman, you know, imagine... Uh, poor example. Uh, I even hate to use this example, but let's just put it very general. Imagine the President of the United States wearing a rosary. And maybe he won't say it much, but people would say, wow, well, he prays the rosary. Maybe I should pray it. And that's what happened. This leader, he prayed, he didn't pray it much, but he held it on his belt. And people, because of that example, took that, that he prayed the rosary every day. And because of that, when he died, he was actually, his sins were far outweigh in his good deeds. His sentence was about to be passed to go to hell. And the Virgin Mary interceded and, and put on the scales that were being held by St. Michael. She put the rosary and all the rosaries that he inspired others to pray and it outweighed his sins. So he was mercifully judged thanks to Our Lady. So there's going to be a lot of examples of that. The, the littlest thing we do for her is big. And let's not do minimum things for Our Lady. Let's do great things for her. Let's be generous with her and really pull out thorns as much as we can, not complaining when we have the cross to carry, but carry it with patience, uniting our sufferings to console the Immaculate Heart of Mary and really seek to make reparation. This is the great the pinnacle of the message of Fatima is make reparation the five first Saturdays 
of reparation. If the, again, I repeat, if every Catholic did this, it would bring a swift end to this horrible nightmare we're living through with this uh, darkness gripping Rome and the cowardice of so many bishops. Let me just close with the example from St. Alphonsus. Blessed Joachim Piccolomini had always a most tender devotion for Mary and from his childhood was in the habit of visiting an image of our Blessed Lady of Sorrows, which was in the neighboring church. Three times a day he would go and visit, and on Saturdays, just for her honor, he abstained from all food. In addition to this, he always rose at midnight to meditate on her seven dollars. But let us see how abundantly this good mother recompensed him. In the first place, when he was a young man, she appeared to him and desired him to embrace the order of the Servites, and this the holy young man did. Again, in the latter years of his life, she appeared to him with two crowns in her hands. The one was composed of rubies, and this was to reward him for his compassion for her sorrows. The other crown was of pearl, pearls as a recompense for his, for his virginity, which he vowed to her honor. Shortly before his death, she once more appeared to him, and then the saint begged as a favor that he might die on the same day on which Jesus Christ had expired. Our Blessed Lady immediately gratified him, saying, It is well, prepare yourself, for tomorrow on Good Friday you will die suddenly as you desire. Tomorrow you shall be with me in heaven. And so it was, for the next day, during the singing of the Passion, according to St. John, at the Mass of the Presanctified, at the words, Now there stood by the cross of Jesus his mother, Blessed Joachim Piccolomini, Piccolomini then expired. The saint also breathed his last, and in the same moment the whole church was filled with an extraordinary light and a most sweet-smelling perfume. So if you were told you're going to die and you're going to be in heaven, wow, wouldn't that be consoling? But in a way, we have been told this. The promise of the five first Saturdays <coughs> and the nine first Fridays are you will die with all the graces necessary to save your soul. In other words, you're going to die a holy death. So let's uh, do these five for Saturdays generously as best we can. And I know the, the live stream, those following Mass, by that they can't get to Mass. But God sees your heart. God sees their goodwill. If they could have Mass, they would be there. And God sees that. So let's do the reparation to her Immaculate Heart generously and let's now go to the very foot of calvary and, and adore christ crucified offer his heart his sacred face his sacred wounds all his 4500 wounds 72 on the head and 630 deep ones let's offer all these wounds in the precious blood of jesus in reparation for our sins and for the conversion of poor sinners and for a swift end of this horrible nightmare of the apostasy of Vatican II. O Mary conceived without sin. O Mary conceived without sin. O Mary conceived without sin. And for those who do not have recourse to thee, especially all communists and Freemasons and other enemies of Holy Mother Church. Amen. In the name of the Father, Son, Holy Ghost. Amen. Amen.